Hello, friends of science. It's good to see everyone here tonight uh, tuning in from all over the country. It is so wonderful seeing all of you here as we are uh, about to start our program uh, tonight, Recollections of a Mad Scientist. My name is Amanda McPhillan. I'm here at the Historic New Orleans Collection. It is literally a dark and stormy night here in New Orleans, so I feel like it is a perfect night to be host hosting this event, and we are so excited to see all of y'all here. So um, just for those of you who may not be familiar with the collection, I just want to tell you just a little bit about us, and then I'm going to talk about the program. So the Historic New Orleans Collection is a museum, a history museum located here in the French Quarter. We are also a research center and a publisher, and we celebrate and explore all of the amazing history and culture here in New Orleans and the Gulf South region. We are so happy to be hosting this program. Um, this original program was a a uh, one-man show that Sid Noel Rideau did on October 13th, 2019. Um, it then came to us to be housed in our archives, and we are now presenting it to you here tonight. Um, here is how the program is going to work. In a minute, we're gonna start the show. You're gonna see about 15 minutes of clips of Morgus at his best. Uh, then we have a special surprise. We recently sat down with Sid Noel's daughter, Natalie Rideau, and two of his former crew members, Paul Werner and Derek Totten. This was hosted by local newscaster, Eric Paulson. They had the three of them sat down to have a conversation about Sid Noel, about working on the show, and of course about his daughter's recollection of him as her father. Um, so we are going to have about 20 minutes of that wonderful discussion. And then we will move on into the heart of the program, which is Sid Noel himself talking about his life and his career as Morgus the Magnificent. That's about an hour of that. And then afterwards, we will have a Q&A. And we are delighted to be joined tonight by Sid's daughter, Natalie Rideau, Derek Totten, and Paul Werner, who worked on the show with him. So if you have questions at the end of the program that you would like them to answer, this is how you do that. I see most of y'all are in the chat here. But if you look down at the toolbar on the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a button that says Q&A. That is where you put your questions that we'll be asking them at the end of the program. We'll be watching the chat, but if you have questions that you want them to answer, put them there in the Q&A. Um, also, some of y'all have been asking us if this recording um, that we're playing tonight will be available afterwards. We will be posting this to our YouTube channel. Um, so it will be there free and available for you to watch afterwards. You can check back there on Friday because it's gonna take us a minute to get it posted. Um, if you go to YouTube and search for the Historic New Orleans Collection, you'll find our channel. And like I said, give us a couple of days, wait till Friday, and you'll be able to see it then. So I think um, we are ready to start the show. And like I said, welcome everyone. Um, oh, also I want to point out, uh, I am also wearing my Morgus t-shirt tonight. I'm very excited about that. Uh, so <laughs> I want to know, I want y'all to know that I'm a big fan as well. Um, so without further ado, if you have, like I said, um, have questions for us, put them in the Q&A, and otherwise, let's get started here. In the evolution of scientific discovery, one outstanding genius appears every 100 years, whose contributions elevate the passage of humankind to a higher order. Sir Isaac Newton. 18th century, Thomas A. Edison, 19th century, Albert Einstein, 20th century, Momus Alexander Morgus, 21st century. I've got it all over me. I know the whole place is contaminated. Oh, gee. Oh, well, uh, yes, well, I've got the uh, de-radioactivity ingredients uh, somewhere around here. Oh, and yes, herein, sir. we celebrate the first 60 years of his story. It all started in 1958, when a local television station discovered a young genius, Momus Alexander Morgus, working in his laboratory above the old city ice house in the historic French Quarter of New Orleans. Upon seeing his incredible discoveries and meeting his two peerless assistants, Chopsley, a faceless giant of a man, and Eric, a cyborg and deceased former assistant whose brain remained alive within a molecular integrated circuit computer. 
The station negotiated with him to set up remote cameras in his lab and telecast his live experiments. This, ladies and gentlemen, became the first reality show in the course of television history. From the Orpheum Theater in New Orleans, welcome to an evening with Sid Noel and recollections of a mad scientist. But first, before Sid arrives, let's peep in and recall some of the most astounding scientific experiments yet to be duplicated in modern science. of science, students, those of the higher order, <laughs> and especially you physicists out there. Tonight, I am going to open up your eyes to a scientific wonder you could never dream possible in your lifetime. Something more impressive than landing on the moon. <laughs> now, I know some of you are already saying, how can this poor scientist living above the old city ice house here in town bring anything of such magnitude to the world? <laughs> Well, keep in mind, my dear friends, the greatest figures in all of history came from very humble surroundings. <laughs> uh, isn't that right, Eric? <laughs> yes, Master. Of course, my computer, Eric, here, plays a very vital role in all of our research. As you may know, Eric stands for Eon Research Infinity Computer. <laughs> Eric is literally a universal library of scientific data. In fact, uh, my father said, Momus, remember, in a land of idiots, he who holds the book of knowledge is king. <laughs> well, my friends, I have got more than the book of knowledge here, including the equations of the higher order. <laughs> I'll give you just a moment to get your notebooks, and then the University of Morgus Research Center will unveil a scientific breakthrough of world significance. <laughs> One moment. Morgus shocks the science world with his instant people machine. You came back at the right time, yeah. We have a celebrity coming here tonight. Uh, I don't know a lot about uh, these kind of uh, singing and musical celebrities, but uh, his name is uh, Kid Diamond. Yeah, I know, Chosley knows him. He's some kind of a, a what, a, a rock, a rocky? A rocky star, yeah. He, he plays music and everything. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, they tell me he's known all over the world and the international press will be here singing. Oh, that could be him. Uh, get it, Chosley. Chopsy's a little excited. <laughs> He's never seen a celebrity. Hey, dude. Whoa. Yeah, all right. Oh. Hey, I'm looking for a dude named Morgus. That's you. I recognize you from the tube. Hey, hi there, fella. So how's it going? Well, you know, we're making it. Uh, yes. All right. And what can you do for me? Well, uh, what we're going to do here. Oh, I'm glad you came down. Yeah. Listen, listen. I, my agent told me to call you. Come over here. Here I am. All right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you in this machine. Now, right. listen. We're going to ship you to Mexico City. Now, of course, you're not going to look like this. You're going to look like, a, well, a jar of sand. Now, I know this sounds silly, <laughs> but once you get there, we're going to restore you in this rejuvenator here. And my friend, the international press is going to take your picture. So all you have to do, get in here, right over here. <laughs> Wait, you, you want me to get in there? Yeah. Y you get in first, buddy. Oh. <laughs> Morgus ends crime by changing the criminal mind with the help of a warden. Oh, hi, friends. We're just making a few adjustments here. Now, as I explained before, we want to make everybody rational. And that way our society will, of course, be safe. Safe from harm. We can empty the prisons. And that's what we're going to do tonight. And, of course, you know, I mentioned that uh, I do have a little political connection with uh, the warden. <laughs> Of course, I can't mention the prison, but, uh, oh, I heard a knock here. Hold on for just a second. You look busy, Chopsley. All right. Oh, Warden. Oh. 
There's no cameras on around here, is there? Camera? Cameras. Oh, oh cameras, no. Oh, no, we don't have any cameras. Uh, we don't own any cameras. Come on, cameras. guys. I... Come on. Oh, yeah, bring him in. Oh, Come yeah. On. Get over there. Get right there. Well. All right, here he is. Well. Now, don't let me down on this. Remember, my political life is hanging here. Oh, yeah, oh. Don't worry about your political life. Oh, Warden, listen. When this thing is over tonight, they're going to be keeping the governor's chair warm for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me tell you, you messed this up. They're going to be keeping a hotter chair for you. The same one he's going to get next Tuesday. What do you mean, chair? What did he do? Six murders. Murders? Murders. I told you I wanted a mugger, not a murderer. Six murders? Yeah, and all doctors. Morgus invents a home medical appliance that eliminates health insurance and the family doctor. Oh, by the way, I'm going to use Chopsley here for a demonstration. Don't worry, Chopsley. Just step inside the analyzer like I told you. All right, get in there. Now, what we're going to do is give a quick demonstration. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. We're going to turn on the analyzer. It will analyze Chopsley's body and give me a little readout here on the printer. And it tells us what medicine to prescribe if he's not healthy. And then, of course, we put him on the, on the treadmill over here because when you take the medicine, we want your blood to operate very quickly. And it pumps your heart up and it makes the medicine get in your body right away. And that's why we have the treadmill. I know you'd be asking later. Okay, Chopsley, just stay right in the middle. Here we go. We'll throw it on. There we go. Up goes the analyzer, down goes the analyzer, <laughs> and here comes the printout. Look at that. Okay, here it is, Shotsley. It says, perfect physical specimen. I guess you, you figured that, huh? Major facial surgery recommended. <clears throat> Possible malpractice suit. Uh, well, of course, never mind. Uh, I did a little surgery on Chopsley a few years ago, and of course, uh, it hasn't healed yet. Bald-headed billionaire visits Marcus for his instant hair transplant operation. Don't turn your TVs off. Don't move. You're in for something you didn't realize. <laughs> As a matter of fact, why don't we go hand me my laser pencil over there, Chopsley? What we do is a simple operation, and I know you might say, now, wait a minute, how are you going to uh, take the scalp off of one person, give it to another, and then this other person grows his hair back? <laughs> it's done with a laser, a laser pen. We only go about 10 mils into the scalp. Oh, what's that right here? Hold this, Chopsley. Uh, I don't want to be disturbed at this hour. Wiley Faye. <laughs> Wiley Fay. Yeah, theatrical producer, manager, you know, showbiz. Say, you look even better in person. Who does your makeup? Makeup? You mean you don't have a makeup man, a, a choreographer, a set designer? Oh, no, I'm a scientist. You... That's not enough, pal. You know, I've been watching you on television. Yeah. You're the talk of the town. <laughs> what you need is a manager, you know, someone to keep them talking, and uh, that's where I come in. Morgus's amazing quick weight loss machine helps him live off the fat of the land. Okay, Big Ben, <laughs> you're in for a surprise, Big Ben. Let's get you out of here. <laughs> Okay, step up here. How do you feel? Uh, wonderful, Dr. Morgus. I feel wonderful, but <laughs> I'm a little weak. Oh, oh yeah, uh, Chopsley, hurry, uh, get him a pill. Oh, that's all right. By the way, no wonder you're weak. You lost 150 pounds. <laughs> and that happens to be $150. $150, please. Oh, certainly. Uh, oh, yeah, Morgus. give me one of these, Chopsley. We're going to give you one of these. This will give you... Uh, 
a little strength right away. And we're also going to give you a bag of these things. I want you to Thank take you. one a day. How much is that? Oh, oh this is $200, Dr. Morgan. Oh, I've but never seen it. Keep any. the change. Oh, oh, thank you, Ben. It's wonderful. This well, is let's wonderful. Go. I Listen. can't wait for my wife to see me like this. Well, tell all your friends about this, Ben. As I a matter of fact, do. we... Uh, oh. oh, doctor. Oh, hello, Mrs. Phillips. You're, you're next, yes. Yes, sir. Oh, I want you to meet uh, Ben here, Big Ben here. Hello, nice yes. to meet you. Oh. <laughs> University of Morgus Research Center helps man with werewolf disease. We may, we may have an epidemic here. We may have wolfsbane epidemic. Uh, oh, Chops, where are you going, Chopsley? Where do you think you're? Oh, don't worry about him. Look, you sit back. I'm going to have to turn you into a werewolf right away. No, doc, can't you don't use worry. a female? No, oh, I can't use my female. She has a a totally different case. Hold steady. Hold steady. All right. This will only take a minute, friends. I'm going to put the moonlight on you. You relax. Just stay straight. Stay straight. All right. All right. The moon ray will be right on you. Okay. Hold it for a second. Oh, it's changing. Look, it's changing. Chopsley. Chopsley. We, we have a werewolf. All right, Chopsley. Get the repellent. Morgus reveals secrets of his past and origins of the higher order. Oh, it was magnificent. It had a beautiful polished surface of limestone and symbols written all over it. I mean, it looked like pop art, but believe me, it was not pop art written on that pyramid. It was covered with universal mathematical equations and formulas. You see, the pyramid was conceived and built under the guidance of very unusual people. They were known as initiates of the higher order. <laughs> they were a small cell of men and women who were placed here from another planet, far ahead of ours. When they saw how primitive we were, they decided to preserve all the mathematical knowledge of the universe into a building and structure that could safely house this information for years to come when we were more developed as we are today. And what did these idiots and stupidies do? <laughs> they tore down all the polished limestone and built temples to the sun. <laughs> oh, those dummies, they're like Chopsley. And of course now, now get ready. Guess who is directly descended from the original cell of Anishits? Morgus gives friends of science equal intelligence above Mensa. Okay, who's next, Chopsley? Okay. What do you mean, you? Oh, come on. You've got to be kidding. Chopsley wants me to elevate him to matzah. Oh, 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 Chopsley, you're my assistant. I mean, you've got to remain a, a, an idiot. I mean, like you are, Chopsley. You play a very important part. Why, uh, if you were made a matzah, why, you'd start reading like these guys, these eggheads, and, and, and you'd get very opinionated. That's right. Why, why we wouldn't even get along, would we, friends? Uh, uh, and, and the Institute needs you. And besides, you, you might even want to get paid. And if you get paid, Chopsley, you know what the government's going to do. They're going to ask you for taxes. You probably buy a car and have to pay for gasoline. No, no, Chopsley. It's a jungle out there. It's a jungle out there. You're very fortunate to be an idiot. <laughs> and you know, a lot of you folks misunderstand the word idiot. Like I told Chopsley, you know what the word idiot stands for? It stands for intellectual diversity in organizing thought. I-D-I-O-T. That's what you are. You're an idiot. Intellectual diversity, Chopsley. <laughs> and you know, he's not just a regular idiot, my friend. Chopsley, I told you, you are the biggest idiot I've ever worked with. <laughs> Morgus clones himself to create subhuman robots called Morgusaroids. By the way, the boss says that there are no trade outs this time. No trade outs? Oh, come on, Harold. Oh, he's getting stingy, eh? Huh? All right, he's going to miss out on something this time. As a matter of fact, I might let you get in on it. <laughs> Chopsley, bring that thing over here. Did you ever see anything like this? Hey, he looks like your twin brother. <laughs> of course he looks like my twin brother. However, 
He is not a human being. <laughs> this happens to be a clone. A clone? A clone. A scientific clone. I made him with this machine. <laughs> now, he looks human, and of course he acts human, but he has very little brain. In fact, you can't hurt him, you know, no soul, no heart, no... Take him away, Chopsley. And that's what I could have done for your boss. By the way, I could... Yes, I think I will do this, Harold. I'll work a deal with you. Imagine having somebody to do all your work for you. He'll do anything you want. I'll make you a clone. You mean you could give me a clone? <laughs> That's right. Look, stand up here. You won't feel a thing, Harold. Believe me. Trust me. You know, we always work things out. You just stay very still and hold your breath. Hold your breath. Very steady. Oh, I just throw a couple of switches right here and right here. Now stand by and watch this. <laughs> oh, look how it comes in. Look how it comes in. <laughs> Beautiful. Come see this, Harold. Come see. Come see it. Come here, you dummy. Get off. Get off. Get off. Grab onto it, Harold. <laughs> That's it. Looks just like you. Have you seen anything like this before? No. <laughs> I'm not. It can go to work for you, Harold. He can deliver the pizzas. Of course. <laughs> Morgus makes contact with extraterrestrials and offers himself in student exchange program. Don't worry. Sounded like Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a... Huh, that's... Mary has like music. Uh, Eric, uh, can, can you interpret that? Yes, master. Three point one four one five nine. Oh, oh no! Seven characters. Mary had a little lamb. Oh, oh! Listen, they're clever, friends. They're clever. You may think that's just a bunch of numbers. Do you know what that is? That's pi. Pi, the universal constant. Why, the initiates of the highest order built the pyramids with pi. Pi, you know, is is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. Circle, nature's most perfect form, and they sent that as the first message, of course. Oh, the sun, the planets, orbits, molecules, they are all round, friends. Waves, yes, even radio waves emanate in circles, in all circles anywhere, even in space. Yes, the equation, the equation A equals pi r square. Oh, it holds true universally. But I must tell you, my friends, <laughs> there isn't a human being alive that can actually draw a perfect circle freehand. Except those of the higher order. <laughs> you engineers, take a picture of this. Bright medical students compete for prestigious University of Morgus diploma. Keep in mind, my friends, we have very high academic standards here at the university. Why, half of these students will probably not make it tonight, I'm sorry to say. Even the finalists will probably not make it. I don't know how many. You see, this is not a diploma factory. We are here... At, yes, what is it? Uh, Dr. Morgus, uh, after we receive our diploma, can we go straight into practice? Of course you can go straight into practice. When you get your diploma, <laughs> they'll be lining up in the streets to sign you up. Why, to own a University of Morgus diploma, do you realize what this means? <laughs> You've got a shot at it, folks. We want you to give it your best, your best shot, okay? Chopsley, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to let them see the diploma right now. <laughs> open, open it up, Chopsley, open it up. All right, now, now try to calm yourselves. In fact, I want you to line up here in single file. I'm even going to allow you to touch it. Touch it. Yes, that's right. Very briefly, though. Uh, get, get that rag there, Chopsley, and wipe, wipe the hands over here. Okay, as you pass up. All right, get ready with it, Chopsley. All right, here it comes here. Get ready. We turn it on, and the diploma of the University of Morgus. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Look at that. Oh, she's beautiful. Morgus solves world food supply by expanding food and shrinking people. Okay, now, step over here next to the machine. Now, this machine, of course, is a compression unit, my friends. 
And with his body heating up like that, radiation and osmosis is taking place. And what happens is, not only do the cells contract, but the actual bones contract. You see there's moisture even in your bones. And that's what contracts under this compression. All right, Shoffley, you just get in there. Don't ask any questions, which I'm sure you can't anyway. Just stand up straight in there like I told you. Now what you're going to see here is the compression of all the molecular structure inside Shoffley's body. Now uh, here we go. I'll just turn it on and you watch what happens to this cylinder up here. It will actually compress, just like in a compression chamber. Here we go. Oh yeah, you see it's coming down. There it is. It's coming down. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, looking good, looking good. <laughs> yes indeed, full compression, 100%. All right, let's cut it down. Now let's open it up. <laughs> And we'll see what Chopsley looks like. Well, <laughs> look at Chopsley. Come on out, Chopsley. <laughs> well, that's how the rest of the world is going to look. Morgus's agent, Wiley Faye, sets up a quiz show to help Morgus choose the right girl to marry. Not number, number uh, two. Uh, yes, what is your IQ? 230. <laughs> no, no, dear. No, not what time. Uh, what is your IQ? 230. Oh, oh, very smart. Yeah, well, that's supposed to be. Uh, yeah, well, number, number three, what is your blood type? A, B, negative. Oh, yeah, well, they're all supposed to be the same. Yeah. <clears throat> well, let's see. Uh, number two, uh, in, the, uh, in the famous equation, E equals MC squared, what does the letters E-M-C stand for? Huh? Eric Morgus and Chopsley. Oh, she got it. She watches the uh, experiments. <laughs> well, uh, uh, number one, number one, uh, this may be a little personal, uh, a little personal. Uh, uh, what makes you excited? I mean, uh, what, uh, what turns you on? <sighs> A man in a lab coat. <laughs> Morgus creates miniature home nuclear power plants at the cost of pennies per month. Oh, hello there, electric company. This is Morgus. <laughs> Listen, what about this bill? You've been billing me every single day. Now, that's kind of that's kind of nasty, isn't it? I mean, you don't send these people a bill every day. I get a bill here. Let's see, $5,982, <laughs> come on now. Oh, the account number. Oh, down at the bottom, yeah, oh, okay, let's see. Oh, $820, $822, come on here, for one day, you, listen, I got a little surprise for you. <laughs> Guess what? As of tonight, your company is being fired as my supplier of electricity. You got that? No, I'm not kidding, just wait and see. <laughs> wow, how do you like that? Boy, are they shaking up. <laughs> Friends, I've got something for all of us that will teach these characters something they will not forget, believe me. <laughs> they, uh-oh, uh-oh, I knew that would happen. I knew it. Okay, Chopsley, get the auxiliary. Get the auxiliary right away. Hurry. Morgus recording device takes away the talent of famous celebrities and turns him into a rock star. Uh, just give us a few bars, you know. Wow. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Well, listen, that, that's why we're here. Uh, Wiley, you hold on to it. And, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to just step over here and I'll explain what's going to happen. Now, you see this machine here? It's like a tape recorder. And it just records your brain waves. And we just kind of kind of heat this thing up and it just kind of takes a little information from your brain. You won't feel a thing. Promise? Promise. I'm telling you. All you have to do is put your head right in here like this, Pete. See, right in there like that. Come, 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 give it a try. You, you'll see, man. Believe me, you won't feel a thing. Just put your head inside. Just take a deep breath. <laughs> okay, guys, here we go. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right. Come on, Wiley. All right, Pete. Hey, Pete. Okay, man. 
Okay, Pete, uh-oh, we got a little problem. Why, just a little. Don't, don't worry about it. Uh, Wait a minute, he, he's got to play a gig tonight. Oh, he does? Uh, yeah. Look, look, where, where are the pills? Uh, look, give, give him these pills. Give him these pills, look. look and just, just take him with you. He, he, he'll be all right, okay. believe me. Okay. Be, okay, come on, Pete. Wait. Come on here. He'll be okay. Wait a second. What if the pills don't work? Oh, uh, well, look, well, you, you call me and I'll, I'll sit in for him. Oh. Lawmakers allow Morgus to create a scientific court of justice with a computerized jury. Bring him in there. <clears throat> okay, the serial parking offender, huh? Take Handicap zones. Oh, my. All right, get over here, fella. Oh, 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 no, 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 Modenbach. Uh, you, you don't have to take an oath in this court. Oh, really? <laughs> Oh, you see, Modenbach, you're going to tell the truth, believe me. <laughs> In fact, I'd like you, uh, you, 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 it says here you have 500 violations for parking in handicap zones. Uh, I want you to walk around the court a little bit here, Modenbach. Let's see here. I got something. Oh, Modenbach, catch that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, Modenbach, hand me the book. You're, you're pretty crisp. Uh, sit down here in the little witness chair, Modenbach. Uh, you know what to do, John Flair. Bailiff, set him up here. Uh, we're going to ask you a few questions, Morton, back here. As a matter of fact, uh, I noticed you were rather adroit there catching that book, Morton, back. Uh, you mind if I call you Clyde? Oh, uh, no, Your Honor. Oh, tell me, uh, tell me, Clyde, uh, are you really handicapped? Oh, yes, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> Morgus takes his mobile medical clinic to the streets and homes of the city. Now, friends, all of you must have some medical problems, uh, sir. I have a problem, Doc. I haven't been able to sleep for more than two hours a night for two years. Oh, is that right? Well, you're an insomniac, you understand? There are a lot of insomniacs out there. People can't sleep taking all these phony drugs and whatever. Listen, fella, I can help you like this. I've got a computer. It tells us what to do. Step back here. Let me show them this. All I do is take out a little cup. All right. You, you, how many hours do you like to sleep? About eight hours. Eight, eight hours. Eight. I'll punch it up. Eight hours. All right, eight hours. Watch this. <laughs> I want you to drink every bit of that, my friend. That's called the eight-hour knockout. And I hope you live very close by. <laughs> How far do you live away? About 15 minutes away. All right, so you've got about 20 minutes before you pull out for eight hours, fella. Oh, Thank that'll be $5, five dollars, please. $5? That's, that's a deal. You couldn't buy that in a drugstore. Good luck to you. All right, anybody, who's next? How about you, sir? I have a problem, doctor. What is your problem? I have a wart on my neck right here. Oh, a wart. Get the wart gun, Chopsley. A wart on the neck. Everybody has warts. People let them stay on there for years. They don't take them off because these dermatologists are so expensive. Watch this. All right. That's $10, fella. $10? but it only took a second. <laughs> it took me 10 years to develop that ward gun, fella. In his last experiment, Dr. Morgus celebrates his greatest scientific achievement. That is the creation of the first of future human beings of a higher order. Okay, now be very careful. Stand by for the cue. Oh, we're back. <laughs> you know, there are evils out there that would destroy this if they knew what we had here. <laughs> now back to the word apocalypse. If you didn't have a chance to look it up in the dictionary, it has to do with the ultimate destruction of evil in our society and in civilization and the triumph of good. <laughs> now that's quite noble, isn't it? <laughs> After all, most of us consider ourselves good already, don't we? <laughs> I know you're good, and of course I know you think I'm good. <laughs> it's the others running around that, that might be evil. You see, of all the planets in the universe, the world is the most beautiful. It's some of the people in it that are evil. And if the people in the world are ever to become good, it won't be because of some political system. It will have to be by scientific means, as I've always said. It just so happens that scientists are already splicing genes and manipulating molecules and making new discoveries in genetic engineering that will improve our lives. Now, here comes the catch-22, you know, the bad news. There are also some evil scientists working in genetic engineering. You know, like some of these mad scientists you see in movies and on television. <laughs> and of course, they have excited the concern of the higher order. So I have instructions that have come down to me from my superiors 
that I, Morgus, am to proceed immediately to bring about the start of a scientific apocalypse that will ultimately bring our entire civilization to a higher order. Ladies and gentlemen, these earth-breaking experiments and the hundreds of other futuristic scientific discoveries by Dr. Morgus have yet to be duplicated in any worldwide laboratory. And let's not forget his syndicated weather lab, where he was once visited by an invisible man. <laughs> ah. Oh, hello there, my friends of science. <laughs> Oh, I hope you have your notebooks handy today because I think I am on the brink of discovering the secret to the solid molecule. <laughs> oh, somebody's knocking already. Always disturbances. Yes, what is it, please? What? Oh, what is it? Do not be frightened, Doctor. You are not seeing things. What? What is I it? I am an invisible man. An invisible man? <laughs> Do not look to be too surprised either, because I think you also are nearing the discovery of the colorless molecule. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm working on it, but, but, but what are you Never doing? Never mind the questions, Doctor. I came here for your help. I can't return to a visible state because part of my memory disappeared with me, and I can't calculate the formula for reinstatement. And you better know the formula. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, well, don't worry, I know... Well, I... get busy on it right away. Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Well, look, why don't you just sit down here in a chair? Uh, just, where are you? Oh, sit down right here in a chair and, and make, make yourself comfortable. All right, you had better know what you're doing or you'll live to regret it. All right, don't, don't worry. Just give me a few seconds. Uh, uh, yes, uh, give me a minute here. Uh, you better uh, get your notebooks. Oh, this is going to be a big one. Give me a minute. Uh, now, you're up there, huh? Now listen, I just want to give you a shot in the arm here, and, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, up here, right, all right. And uh, this will restore color to your solid molecules, you see, and then you'll be visible within a matter of a minute, you see. Well, for your own sake, you had better be right. <laughs> well, don't worry, don't worry, wait. <clears throat> okay, okay. <clears throat> That's all. <laughs> well, you just cool it right there. <laughs> uh, we can't forget to give you the weather, folks, you know, no matter what we... What we get involved in, friends, we always give you that morgus kind of weather. You just listen right there. She's coming right out. <laughs> and once again, the morgus weather machine comes through. <laughs> oh, gee. Didn't work. <clears throat> Uh, now look, uh, it may take a little. Oh, now wait, wait, wait a minute. I say it may take a little, little while. Oh, what are you doing? Wait, wait a minute. What are you doing? What are you doing? Ow! Oh, what are you gonna try to do? Oh, look, give me a break. Hey, hey wait, wait. You know the people are watching. They'll call. They'll call the police. You know. You can't do this. I happen to be a well-known scientist around this town. You. Hello, police. Oh. Send the wagon right away to the old city ice house. There's a maniac running wild on the top floor. A, a maniac. Oh, 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 what are you doing to me? Oh, oh. Ladies and gentlemen, like the Wizard of Oz, he has been hiding behind the curtain for over 60 years. Now, would you please give the warmest of welcomes to the Wizard of Morgus, Sid Noel.
Instagram sort of sucks. <laughs> 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 tonight with all the traffic and everything. Forgive my voice today. That's another story for the doctors. But I am so happy to be here because uh, really this is the end of a beginning for me. And uh, to have all my friends here is, is really special. Uh, of course, I, uh, I could, you know, I could be the life of a party still, you know, <laughs> till, well, till 7.30 at least. <laughs> Can't say I warned you. But really, don't tell me short because I am a survivor. I have survived over 70 years of life without an iPhone, friends. <laughs> Right. When I was growing up, like some of you, we had telephone booths. They were everywhere, on every other corner, you know? Even in the comics, uh, uh, yeah, Superman would fly into a phone booth, change his costume. My gosh. If he came down here today, he'd have to use a porta potty <laughs> He would. He really would. But listen, here. We have some history to cover tonight. And by the way, if you don't know the past, it's so difficult to enjoy the future. So I want to take us back, not to the good old days, but to my good young days. Back to the early 50s. You know, back then, uh, only girls had earrings. <laughs> and I tell you, uh, only sailors had tattoos. And, and if, you, if you went into a phone booth back then, uh, you, with a nickel, you could talk all day. Oh, by the way, uh, you didn't have to press one to get English either. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's true. But listen, I was 22 years old, single, and I was breaking into radio. Radio was so big. Oh. You know, words, words give imagination. And I wanted to be a part of that. So when I was at Loyola, I'd taken some extra courses in communications and they had a radio course. Well, they owned a radio station. We even went there a couple of times to learn about radio. But more than anything, they taught elocution. It was important to speak by syllables. And you know, in New Orleans or New Orleans or New Orleans, no, you couldn't get in the radio with that. You had to hit the four syllables. But I'll tell you what else it taught. It taught you that if you're going in the radio, you might want to change your name. Oh, really? Well, yeah, that's right, because your name could become a household word, and you want to protect your spouse, you know, your children for privacy. I like that idea. I said, yeah, I think I will. So I tried to think of a name. Of course, first I thought of Cary Grant, but... <laughs> Ah, uh, that was already. By the way, his name was really Archibald MacLeish. Uh, I wonder if Grace Kelly knew that. <laughs> Imagine having love with. Oh, well, never mind. But I tell you, that was true. And uh, back then, uh, what we did was uh, try to get people interested in finding which kind of. Uh, stations and what type of future you wanted. I wanted to be in radio, but TV was coming along. But anyway, I worked at little stations at first on the weekend. One was WJMR on the weekends. And then you move over to the big top 40 music stations. The idea was to get with the network stations because that's where the future was. So I eventually worked with WSMB, owned by the Sanger Theater and Maison Blanche. And I was there for a couple of years. But TV was coming in, radio was changing then, and that was, yeah, in the middle 50s. And the stations were dropping the soap operas, especially over at WWL, 
where they had Arthur Godfrey. They decided they were going to drop the morning show there we all grew up with, the Dawn Busters. And uh, they were going to drop the Dawn Busters, the whole staff, and uh, bring in a host. So they put the word out around the community that they were looking for a local Arthur Godfrey. Well, of course, I heard about it. But I thought about it. Well, maybe I'll go over there and try for it. So I eventually did. And I must tell you, without wasting time, they did choose me. But one thing bothered me when I took the job. I said, look, maybe I could be your, your author Godfrey here, but there's one thing I won't have anything to do with, that silly ukulele thing. I said, now, if you want me to play ukulele, I can play ukulele. <laughs> oh, you've got the job. That's how I got the job, I believe it or not. And I said, what do I do? They said, well, I want you to keep it Keep it happy in the morning. People are driving. Make them smile. I said, oh, I've got a couple of ideas. I said, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to have people call in. Or I can call. Oh, no, you, you can't do that. Oh, they can't call in? Oh, no. People might say some vulgarity or something. We couldn't have that at WWL. Or we'd lose our license. Said, oh, okay. Well, there goes that idea. So uh, later on, though, I must tell you, I did it anyway. I fooled... <laughs> Well, I fooled the manager. I put the word out that I was going to talk to Nikita Khrushchev. <laughs> and I said, I've got a long distance. He says, is he really going to do that? He said, I don't know. He says he's going to do it. So he, I said, listen in. And those sorts they did. And I, you got him on? You got him hooked up? Hello, Nikita. Sit down well. Yes. New, New Orleans, of course. Oh, you do? You've been here? Oh, no. KGB, what's that? Oh, oh, yeah. Here, yeah? Oh, really? Uh, what do they do? Uh-huh, bugs. What bugs? Oh, they put bugs, bugs around? Oh, really? Well, let me tell you something. You have a lot of bugs. We have more pest controls here that can handle anything you bring. <laughs> anyway, that was the kind of thing we did. Uh, <laughs> make people smile. And laugh. One of my little favorite things while we're in radio, uh, I like history. So I came up with a little weekly thing with history, like the untold secrets of history. On this day, 1620, the pilgrims, while sailing on the Mayflower, narrated by Henry, the nearsighted navigator, all landed, <laughs> all landed and set foot on the rock of Gibraltar. Yeah. <laughs> bah, 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 the music goes on, you know. I just have one more to throw on you because it's so old, but... <laughs> It was a good one. The, yeah, stand by for this one. On this very day, in 50,000 B.C., Adam and Eve walked out of the Garden of Eden to a new land called Louisiana. <laughs> in order to be able to raise Cain. <laughs> I'll take one on that one. Yes. <laughs> yes, but anyway, we had to move ahead because WWL wanted a television station. So they put in an application for Channel 4. How did they go through the FCC to get that? However, they found out that the Times Picayune, a very great company, was applying for the same channel. So they had to go neck and neck with the FCC, almost went to court. But finally, the FCC decided, the times Picayune is a great company, but it was more like a monopoly because they had bought out the state's item and they even had a radio station, WTPS. So they decided to give Loyola Channel 4. However, with a caveat, the caveat was Loyola would have to separate the two stations and neither one could work with the other. Finally, WWO got it, moved in in 57, and I stayed back in radio, but most of the people went to television. But I was happy with my morning job there. But I must tell you, it wasn't a year later, I get a call from Ed Herner, who was the program director of WWO at the time, and he said, Sid, we've uh, purchased this huge package of horror films and science fiction movies. And uh, 
we're looking for a host. And I said, well, why me? I said, I didn't think I could work over that. He said, well, we talked to the lawyers and uh, they've come up with an idea that you wouldn't be an employee of them. That's why. Shows you how these lawyers are, folks. <laughs> I mean, they would, no one would want to, you will be a private contractor. Oh, really? I'll be a private producer. Well, frankly, friends, I had never been in a television station at that time. So I said, well, I'll come over and we'll talk about it. I went right away in that afternoon. No sooner I get inside, they take me to the studio. They had already set up a little demonstration there. They had angel hair hanging to look like spider webs. And they had a big cauldron, a really big sugar cauldron, bubbling with dry ice in it. And they had a witch's brew, and they had a broom and a hat. Well, I figured some witch took, took a shot at getting that job. <laughs> but, <laughs> so uh, they wanted me to just do a minute or two. And so but I had to say, what am I going to do? I don't want to talk in my regular voice. And I thought of Boris Karloff. You remember Boris Karloff? Weird looking guy. And, but he was in everything. And he had an English accent. He'd say things like, oh, oh. Pass the antipasto. <laughs> Pass the antipasto. Weird looking guy. I said, I'm going to do that. So I said that to myself. Okay, turn it on. I'm sitting there. Oh, they said, you've got to put a hood on. Well, I put the hood on, so forth. And I said, I just said something like, uh, well, good evening. Uh, welcome to my abode. And I took the broom and turned it upside down. So it's stirring the big pot. And I, I just mumbled a bunch of things that, oh, I am cooking up something for you tonight. You will, you will not wake up in the morning. <laughs> you know, anything like that. I was just ad-libbing. And they say, stop it, you got the job, Sid, let's talk. <laughs> so that's really happened. So <laughs> thank you. Hey. Here comes the funny part. <laughs> what do I do? I said, you folks have a writers? Oh, no, we don't have writers. This is your bit. Oh, OK. I said, uh, well, uh, we're going to have a set. No, oh, no, we don't have a budget. <laughs> we don't have a budget. Remember, they were just in this year, so really, they didn't have much of anything. And I said, well, uh, who's ever done this before? Oh, there's a guy in New York called Zachary. I said, what does he do? He said, uh, he's, he's a vampire. Said, oh, God. I said, I don't like that. He said, well, you, you can be anything you wish. And I said, when is this beginning? He said, oh, you won't have to start till January. Well, that's three months away. I said, oh, OK. I can think of something. So uh, I said, one more thing. If I do this, I don't want my name attached in any way to this thing. <laughs> I said, I mean, you know, I may have some old girlfriend out there. <laughs> what the heck is he? Uh, you know, what would you think of if that happened to you? And you think of, you know, I've got a good job. It sounds like I could do very well over here. But be, oh, no, nobody will ever know. I said, OK. So on that basis, we made a nice arrangement. So I went home to think. Ladies and gentlemen, when you start thinking like that, back in those days, what they wanted to do and I figured what they were after. I would go in and out of the movies, and I'm thinking, how? You have to always think of what show number 12 is going to be like. Not that first one. You can get by that one. But you have to have something that'll carry to each one. You can't say boo every week. can't be ugly every week. So I have to figure out what to do. But right away, it hit me, because when I found out the first movie they were going to be running was Frankenstein. And of course, there was Victor Frankenstein, a mad scientist, you know? I'm thinking, maybe I could do that. So I quit thinking about that, but I didn't say anything to them because they'd say, oh, that's not spooky enough. So I began to think about it. So then I started thinking, well, you know what I'm going to tell them? I said, look, he's not spooky enough, but what he's going to do is going to be very spooky. <laughs> oh, really? What are you going to do? I said, well, you know, he's going to have to maybe do some operations. Oh, really? What kind of a... I said, look, don't get into it, please. Because I said, once he takes over, you'll have to talk to him. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just like that. 
you know, and we planted and uh, so how do, you, how do you dress up for something like, you have to think of an eccentric, you have to th think of others who look, I thought of Einstein with all the hair. I said, oh, he'd have to have a lot of hair and uh, so forth and so on. He'd have to be brilliant, but almost too brilliant for, him, for his own cause. And that's how I started with it. Then you have to dress him. And it's like making, painting a, a picture where you put the background and that's what you want to do and just give them enough so that they'll want more because I couldn't have a set, I couldn't do anything. Oh, it's in black and white, and oh, uh, it's live. There's no, no, there's no tape? No, you have to do this live. Oh, you never told me that. That really happened that way. And I'm thinking, man, what did I get into? You know, I've got good scripts and radio, stuff I write and read, it sounds like I'm so funny, but, uh, then I thought thinking about it, and as you get into it, you have to figure out how you're going to handle it. So everything was kind of verbal for the first few shows we did with Morgus. Uh, he just came on, and what he said was weird. And what he said you wanted to know more about, you know, that kind of thing, where you can keep their interest. But what I discovered suddenly is that, wait a minute, he could, he could not emulate the movie, but he could satire it, you know? And that's what I did here. So we started that way. Whatever the movie's about, we did a satire on it, or he did. Sometimes he'd, he'd really knock the movie and they'd say, wait, don't go too far with that, they'll turn you off. But before I realized it, we ended up with a show within a show. And I could see that happening. I'm thinking, hey, we're playing with oil and water here. So what do you do? How much more do I do? with the movies. But I must say, some of the movies were so bad, anybody here, <laughs> anybody here could have taken over my part. But that's what the way it was there. But uh, one thing I wanted when we started, first of all, they never questioned me like that was my baby, they said. So nobody ever said, hey, what are you doing? We, no, they let me do what I wish. And I wanted to surprise them when it opened. They didn't know it was coming. So when Morgus first opened up that very first night, I had Rupert Kopernick, my dear friend, was the director, and we had chemicals all lined up on the tables and everything. And I said, look, we're going to pan those cables, take it, don't show them what's coming. And when they come, they're going to come to Eric, he'll say good evening, you know, that sort of thing. So then picture, come on up there with the camera all the way up to Morgus' face and let him say something. And what he said was, oh, good evening, I've been waiting for the, those people at the television station to turn on these cameras they have in my laboratory. <laughs> wow, wow, New Orleans said, wait a minute, we have a, a guy in the French Quarter? We, <laughs> you know, they did. And, I, and that's it, it kind of set in place, like, wait a minute, we got a nut here in town. <laughs> you know, and so, we go on, we go on, and, and, and he says he, what he's going to do is elevate the city and all of that sort of thing. So here's this nut going to elevate the city, and I'm thinking, I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I said it. And, uh, that's how it started, and that way we could, I figured we could just go along, and surely we did. And I told him, look, I'd love to have an assistant. They said, oh, no, you can't have an assistant. We don't have the budget. Oh, yeah, I, I said, I know. But I said, it will be a, a, an assistant that doesn't speak. Oh, really? <laughs> I said, well, look. I said, uh, yeah, that's what, well, if he spoke, he'd have to join SAG, which is the Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> said, well, well, that's good. <laughs> so what happened, uh, I kept that in the back of my mind. So at first, you know, I wasn't allowed to get the extra, but then uh, Mardi Gras came, it was in February, so just about a month later, I told him, I could see the crowd, uh, oh my God, they seem to like this guy, Morgus. So I went back to them after when I got back, hey, I'm gonna ha I told them, I'm gonna have an assistant, I don't know what you're gonna pay him, but we, Morgus needs an assistant. Well, they didn't know it, but I'm a fan of Don Quixote. And Don Quixote had Sancho Panza. And I always thought of Morgus as a Don Quixote in a lab jacket. 
So that's, that's a good way, you know. And people say, you know, I've seen somebody like this before. You know, when they see Morgus, where did I see? Oh, that's Don Quixote. So, so that's how we brought in Chopsley. You know, Chopsley was one of his old students at his old uh, medical university of Vasco da Gama. <laughs> Out there in the Caribbean, of course. And uh, that's where they were. So he arrives, and of course, now Morgus, Morgus and, and Chopsley were ready to slay the windmills of science. Because I had this guy. Now we could do things up there. So that's where it started to expand. But suddenly, one day, I, I, they see we have a set. So they well, how did you get that set? Well, what we did in the set, we traded out everything. I went out in the streets. I went to Tulane, Loyola, and then I went to Tulane. And they gave me all sorts of things, operating tables and Bunsen burners, <laughs> glassware. Because even Joe Bakshish, that was his name, he was the artist there who built all the sets. And he said, man, where did you get the money for this? I said, I didn't pay a dime for it. <laughs> How did you do that? I said, it's called trade out. So what we do is said, we'll give you a plus. But they didn't ask in the schools for a trade out. They just said, hey, they were glad to help. The guys at LSU took me to the basement of Cherry Hospital. He said, take what you want. Well, can you imagine? <laughs> so that's how Morgus got all of that glassware and so forth. So that was the surprise. The set. Well, in order to have that, you needed a set. So that's how the set suddenly got in there and that we could do a little more with Chopsley and get into and, uh, and, and satire of the movies. So that went along very well. It got so well that the station couldn't find any room for more commercials. <laughs> so they said, Sid, what can you come up with? Uh, and I said, what do you mean? Well, maybe something for the kids. And I'm thinking, oh, that's nothing much for the kids. We have to be careful here. I said, oh, I know what we can do. We can do a weather show. And they said, oh, really? Is Morgus going to do weather? I said, no. Morgus's computer will do the weather. Oh, really? What would it look like? Well, what it looked like was probably the size of a small elephant, of course, as you know. It became the Morgusatronic Electroprognosticator. <laughs> and nobody had ever seen a huge computer back in early 60s. It wasn't there. And you start it up, the local booth announcer's voice came out of it at the 60 seconds, uh, 30 seconds to give the local weather. So that means you could take this to any city and the local booth announcer could use this program I said, wow, this would be great for syndication, maybe. So that we put aside later. But it gives you a little idea of how all of this, I mean, you start out as a nice guy in the morning, you end up with something like this. It just, <laughs> you know, and, and people, and that was the worst, the beginning of it. I get a call from Mr. Gene Colloin, who owned a lot of movie theaters. And he and his brother-in-law, uh, Jules Savan, they wanted to make a movie. I said, wow, gosh, a movie. I said, I, I don't know. I said, well, you can do it. You can do it. I said, well, tell me about it. They said they'd put up all the money. They had all these connections in California. So we did it. We decided to do the movie. It took me leaving business at Loyola and at WWL and going into the movie business for a year. And it did take a year. By the time you write the screenplay and learn a little bit about movies. And of course, it did not win the Academy Award. <laughs> Well, let me tell you, it did win the New Orleans Police Academy Award. <laughs> we, 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 gave, we, we gave the police a lot of part-time work when we were making the movie. They, it was true. They, that, that's how that came along. But nonetheless, I had to move away after that. And uh, suddenly, I decided, well, we're going to do, we're going to try to syndicate that weather idea. So Larry Carino, who had been the former uh, manager of WL, was now with Stora Programs, a syndicator, and he worked out of Detroit. And darn it, he wants me to come up there, and Stora was going to sign a contract to make 120 weather shows. And it would pick it back with one of their kid shows. The kid show was in 75 markets. Well, wow, I could see the dollar bills at that time, you know. Well, we got there, they put this thing. Well, we did. We went up to uh, Detroit, Michigan, 
And uh, while we were there, they said, oh, by the way, while you're here, couldn't we do Morgus on one of the nights, like Friday night? I said, well, oh, maybe. Yes, we did. So we did a Morgus show, Morgus Presents in Detroit. And it caught on as it did here, practically. But after finishing all those shows in black and white, as we're finishing and I'm waiting for the first check to arrive, get a call and said, by the way, they just brought in color television. We had 120 black and white <laughs> Marcus shows. We were only in about four or five markets at that time. They said, Sid, you can have all the tapes. We don't want the thing. I said, well, what am I going to do with it? I said, well, maybe I can sell the tape to somebody. Because we, there was nothing you could, you, you could do with a black and white uh, program. So back to New Orleans I went. They said, come back. We're waiting for you. Went back on WWL TV, radio, weather show, 1965. We're on our way again. And of course, back then, it was like coming back alive again, you know? And uh, so we walked in. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so we started out, comes 1967, the Saints came to town, okay? Uh, yes, well, <laughs> the Saints came and, and the station, they had to set up a remote program out there at uh, Tulane Stadium and get in on all that new business. So they stopped all local programming. So for that purpose, we all left and that's it. But WDSU was waiting, he called me and said, would you like to bring Morgus over here? So I said, well, maybe so. So we did. We brought it over to WDSU, but they didn't have the movies really to go with it, and things didn't quite go along as we had hoped there. But it worked out real nice, because suddenly Morgus decided he needed a sabbatical. <laughs> yes, he did. And, you know, after that, we took 18 years sabbaticals together. <laughs> 1987 comes in, folks. Yes. Yes, it did. In 1987, the microelectronic revolution. And desktop computers are here. And even Morgus fans with desktop computers were out there. One nice lady by the name of Judy Martin worked with the New Orleans Public Library. She was keeping records of Morgus at the library. She was a big fan. And then there was, there was Robert Fuller, who was a, a geek. He was already into, into computers. He sent letters to the Times-Picayune editor saying, why don't we get Morgus back? Well, guess what? I got a call from Bobby Gremion, manager of WGNO, an ABC station owned by the Tribune Broadcasting. And Bobby said, hey, could we bring Morgus back? I said, well, let's talk about it, but uh, uh, I don't know. Is Tribune along with it? He said, I've checked it out with Tribune. I said, well, th they're syndicators, aren't they? He said, yes. So for that, it kind of talked me into trying it. So, I mean, how do you go back to a job you did 18 years ago and jump right in? But we did that. But in order to do it, we would be independent from any station. So we'd make this program so it could go with any station. Therefore, we had to rent space, and WDSU was very helpful. We rented studio space every Thursday night to produce Morgus. So I needed the right people to come with me, and uh, I would say Paul Yasich worked there for many years. He now had his own little production company. So when I talked to Paul about it, he was so excited with it. So was his wife, Rita. And I said, come with me here, let's see what we can do. And so they came on board, and I could not have done anything without them. But you know, when you put something like that together, there are two sides to this. You need other people. And I needed, I personally needed a kind of a Sancho Panza. I needed someone who was a Sancho Panza, but with a lot of talent and ideas and so forth. I found that in Mr. Phil Broadbridge. Mr. Phil Broadbridge, and I tell you, he's in this audience, 
Where's Phil Broadbridge? Here he is. Phil. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Did I leave out Robert Fuller? He must be here. Robert Fuller, where's, stand up Dr. Fuller. Dr. Fuller, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, I tell you, that, that's really something. Well, from there, we, we were going on the air with a new program. And we wanted that new program to have the same effect the original one had on the opening. And in the opening of program one, in that series, when the cameras came on Morgus and he said, good evening, friends of science, those of the higher order. And, oh my goodness, what is this all about? I mean, it was like that. What's this higher order business, you know? Then the camera moved over to Eric, who's sitting atop a pyramid computer, okay? This is the Eon Research Infinity computer. My goodness, he's way ahead of these guys already. By the way, speaking of that, Morgan said he would, he would try to send Eric over here to say hello. Did they send Eric over here? Is, oh, Eric's here, Eric. Eric, oh man, bring Eric here. Oh, this is great, this is really great. This is really, oh. Thank you. Oh, Eric, I tell you, you know, everybody's talking about AI, you know, artificial intelligence. This is AI. This is, this is authentic intelligence. <laughs> By the way, is that right? Isn't that right, Eric? Eric, is that right? Yes, master. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. By, by the way, did, did you happen to vote yesterday in the election? Yes, master. Oh! Well, look, would you like to stick around and help me entertain these people? No, master. Get him out of here. Get him out here. Okay, well, let's give him a hand. I... No. <laughs> Uh, but now, uh, you remember Paul Harvey in radio? He's the one that always said, uh, and now here comes the rest of the story. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. And I'm, you may not want to believe me. Uh, if logic tells you that I'm just making things up, please stick with me. <laughs> Give up logic. Okay. When Morgus was on his sabbatical, he was taken over by extraterrestrials. This is true. He was, you heard about that? Ah, he couldn't have been. He was, friends. They're out there, but these are not the guys around the spaceships running around. They're up here. They're up here in what is called brain waves. You know, a dimension that you and I know nothing about. But they can make suggestive thought implants into all of us. You say, oh, I thought of that idea. No, you didn't. They did. <laughs> this is true. You, you won't believe this nonsense now, but you're going to see it come to truth like there. And that's what happens with suggestive thought implants. They were to take over the entire Morgus program because he's well known on television. So they're going to help Morgus spread ideas that will raise the elevation of our planet. This, this poor scientist working in the old city ice house? Yeah, he can do it. Shows you things like that come in strange places, right? And that's what it's all about here. So that's how we set up that pattern of, of uh, shows for 52 weeks. And what it was all about was having Morgus in a biography. The whole programs would be a biography of Morgus. Each of the experiments would be a chapter in the biography. It would be a verbal, that's right, and, and, and a visual biography. But we had to know about Morgus, so he had to have a, a, a pedigree. 
And we found out, as many know, that his ancestry goes back to the Great Pyramid, where Morgus number one was the chief architect of the Great Pyramid in Egypt. So he was proud of that. Absolutely. You'll find it out. He'll, and at, you know, I'll tell you another thing what we find out in the biography. When he was five years old, <laughs> this is hard to believe, he, he mastered the differential calculus. He did. When he was six years old, he already had studied the dialogues of Plato. Well, his mother didn't know what to do with this guy. She said, you know, he needs a little culture. And one night, she took him to, an, to a ballet. They all sat there quietly, and the curtain opens up, and the ballerino comes out, and he takes his pal. And then three beautiful ballerinas come out, high tiptoeing. Morgus t whispers to his mother, why don't they get taller girls? <laughs> That's where that joke came from, by the way. So, <laughs> but <laughs> we, uh, we were in the late 80s there with the WGNO, so they took us into the early 90s. And there we went into a little syndication. Morgus ended up in New York City for a while and places like all the little towns, but didn't go out very far because there are different elevations and failures in television and ratings. So uh, there was like a, a depression. So it was hard to sell syndicated shows. But we went on and did our thing here. And uh, Morgus would go out and, and make uh, uh, different uh, appearances. He's in one appearance and uh, you know, when these celebrities are asked questions, and, and they always say, oh, I'm glad you asked that question. No, they're not. They're not <laughs> glad. <laughs> yeah, they'll say it. Well, that happened to Morgus, and that's why I remember this. Morgus is in front of some audience, and this, this kid raises his hand, and he says, what is this kid? And the kid says, now this is when Morgus first came back from Detroit, uh, and the kid said, Dr. Morgus, why, why, are you, why, are you, why are you not as ugly as you used to be? <laughs> well, Morgus said, well, oh, that's a great question. He said. <laughs> oh, that, that is very hard what he said. I didn't say one way to think of it. He said, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, kid. He says, you know, it's called metamorphosis, you see. He said, we, as you get smarter like me, you change. And he said, one day, you won't look like this. When you get older, you'll start changing and looking differently. And the kid said, yeah, maybe so. And Morgus says, and, but in my case, it's really called metamorgosis. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in the 90s, uh, we were getting a lot of publicity in the magazines. And uh, I got a nice letter from a gentleman up in Detroit, Michigan, who worked with one of the biggest uh, motor companies. He was a very established IT specialist. And uh, he's into computers, of course. And uh, he was a Morgus fan. When he was a teenager in Detroit, Michigan, back in the 60s, he was keeping account of everything, as kids did back then. And he was surprised that Morgus was back here in New Orleans and everything. And he said, you know, I'm in computers. I would like to build a website for Morgus. And so I got on the phone with him and I said, look, I'll put you in touch with Morgus. And we did. And, and uh, he put together a fabulous website called Morgus Presents Online. It's on every telephone <laughs> in the world right now. Morgus Presents, yes. And what a difference is, his name was Chuck Belowski. Chuck Belowski is in the audience somewhere. Is Chuck Belowski here from Detroit? Right under my nose, come here, buddy. I'm glad this worked out. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, that is great. Well. That took, us, that took us to the year 2000. And of course, we went off the air for a while. And uh, we would uh, suddenly hear a phone call here comes in.
from Cox Communications. They wanted Morgans, except they, they didn't have movies. They wanted to make a sitcom out of Morgan. So we did. We edited it to a half-hour sitcom, and Cox Communication brought Morgus into the 21st century. So that went on very well. And of course, we had new members and new people calling in. Sure enough, somebody visits Morgus and uh, starts asking questions. I forget what group we were standing in front. But this fellow said, Dr. Morgus, is there another planet like Earth in our universe? Morgus says, oh, exactly like it. But it's in another galaxy. Exactly like the Earth. However, I must tell you, there are no people on that Earth like ours. You see, they do not have a Garden of Eden. Oh, they do not have a Garden of Eden on that other Earth? Oh, no, maybe it's, it'll come in a few million years. So that's how he explained how that could be. Think about that. Another planet, will it have humans on it? We don't know. I'll let the brains think about that one. The other fellow says to me, Einstein said that the fastest thing in the universe is the speed of light. Is that true? Morgan says, no, it's not true. Why, what is it? Morgan says, the speed of dark. <laughs> what? Dark? Who ever heard of the speed of dark? Because it does, it exists. He said, the speed of light, speed, 186,000 miles a second, it goes around the Earth seven times in one second? Yeah, that's pretty fast. He said, but turn off that light at home. Where do you think that light goes and how fast does it go? He said, it doesn't travel. It instantly speeds to nowhere in a millionth of a second. That's how fast it is. Well, you can't argue with that. You cannot argue with it. That's right. Uh, then we, in, we get a call from Hollywood. There's a national program called, uh, what is that program you call, uh, Coast to Coast AM, I think it is? Uh, 600 radio stations, a fellow by the name of George Newry. He's on the air every night. He was from Detroit, Michigan, and uh, he remembers Morgus and it encouraged him to get into science. So he runs a science discussion show, and he heard about Morgus still being alive, so he, <laughs> he did. He called, he said, Morgus, I didn't know you were still alive. <laughs> so <laughs> he called me, <laughs> the nectar of the gods is due. And he said, my, could we have a conversation? It's a fact. We talked that first time for two hours on the air, coast to coast. And there are enough nuts out in this country <laughs> to, to call in and try to take down Morgus. <laughs> and, you know, it's true. You think about it. And this guy calls in and says, hey, Dr. Morgus, I don't know what town he was in. He said, I'm, let's assume I'm on the 80th floor uh, of a high rise and the cable breaks in my elevator. He said, should I jump up and down as it's falling? Morgan says, oh, no, no, don't do that. You'll, you'll get a skull fracture. He says, stand against the wall with your feet on the floor until you hit. The guy said, well, will I be okay? He said, of course you'll be okay. Of course you'll be two feet shorter than you are. <laughs> You can be a jockey, well, okay. But, and another fellow calls in real nut. He said, Dr. Morgus, I am in a spaceship traveling at the speed of light. And he said, I want to ask you a question. What would happen if I turned my lights on? <laughs> Morgus told George, said, George, turn that idiot off and let him freeze out there. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> but, you know, along with that comes about uh, 2010, 
And I get a call from Channel 8. They were the only station that hasn't had Morgus. And they wanted Morgus to stay in. Tom Benson made it all possible, I think. So we went right back on with the sitcom over there for a couple of years. And then, of course, Katrina. I, I forgot to mention, oh, how could I forget Katrina? We were all in Katrina because everybody was concerned. Everybody went off the air. Morgus did also. And after Katrina, Cox wanted to bring Morgus back to help the city feel like we're okay. So they went on the billboards everywhere, a picture of Morgus saying, make New Orleans magnificent again. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> you know, that really was, that really touched me. So we did, we went back after Katrina, and then it went off after a year or two. Then, you know, in uh, last year, uh, New Orleans reached 300 year celebration, of the tricentennial, and the Times-Picayune uh, got some historians together to pick out the most influential people in history of their era and so forth, and I couldn't believe it. But, but they put Sid Noel and Morgus. That's the first thing they did. I did. I gotta mention it. <laughs> they did. I mean, <laughs> no, really. I, I, I told Morgus about it. I said, you know, you are, you are influ influential. What, what are you going to do? He said. He said, look, when you're influential, I'm going to do something very influential. We're going to do something for the two big things that make New Orleans, jazz and food. I said, well, he said, I have written a jazz song, a traditional jazz song. He said, and I am donating this song and have already done so to the New Orleans Jazz Museum. They're excited about it and they're going to produce it for Posterity. And then I would like to sing it if I could, but I can't sing like that. So what I'll do, oh, I'll rap it. <laughs> because it has great lyrics. It tells the story of jazz. So they can use it as a theme song over there at the museum. And it tells about what really is where jazz really began. You know, there's a big bend in the Mississippi River right at the French border, a big bend in the river. And jazz began right there in the French Quarter. So it goes like this. Down on the river bend, where it all began, they play the greatest New Orleans jazz. You want to linger a while to hear that style. Music once called rag. You're going to clap your hands, oh, when that trombone man blows a few bars before they begin. And when that south wind blows those notes around, the saints start marching in. Now, one man will blow, the rest clap hands, then all join in with that Dixieland. Oh, how they love it. Oh, how they dig it down on the river bend. Take it, shorty. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and one last <laughs> well we all like food and New Orleans has so many dishes the world loves also you know what that is and of course there's nothing like the famous roast beef sandwich so Morgus came up with a, holly, um, uh, a Halloween sandwich for all the po' boy stands and he chose one of the stands that he almost grew up with and that was Parkway uh, Po' Boy. You know Parkway? Yeah, so, but it's not a commercial for them, but it's a place I wanted to give it to them to start because I want all the other Po' Boy places to try this. It's for Halloween for the season every year. It's called the Edgar Allan Po' Boy. <laughs> and, he, he, he drew a little couplet that goes with it. It goes like this. The Edgar Allan Poe boy buried in its gravy. 
is the favorite sandwich of the Raven, Cajun Navy. <laughs> Eat, eat forevermore, and may you love and laugh forevermore. Thank you. <laughs> Say good night, Eric. Good night. Hello, friends of science, and thank you for joining us. The clips we just saw were unbelievable. As Amanda just mentioned, uh, those clips aired back when the show first started on the channel I work for, WWL-TV, in 1959. My name is Eric Paulson. I'm the anchor of the Eyewitness Morning News. I got here in the uh, mid-70s, around 1977, and Morgus at that time at Channel 4, WWL-TV, was a legend. Uh, and and we're going to talk about a true legend. I mean, because Morgus was, was just unbelievable. He was a, a force of nature, or maybe a force of science, one of the two. Anyway, we have some, uh, so a great panel here uh, today. Uh, first of all, we have Sid's daughter, uh, Natalie Rideau. By the way, Natalie, the first time I, I understood that, because that, I always knew Sid as Sid Noel, and then all of a sudden we find out he's Sid Noel Rideau. Yes. So we'll talk about your private life, and well, not your private life, but <laughs> how he Thank kept you. things private, even from his kids. And then some Morgus crew members from the 80s, Paul Warner, uh, and, uh, and you were a performer too, right? Yes. A performer, you performed on the show, okay. And then, and then Derek, you were a production assistant. Yes. And you guys, you guys were with the show back in the 80s, correct? Yes. yes. So you missed the early days. I was out of town for the early days. I'm, I'm a New Orleans native, but I was out of town for that uh, period of time. And Natalie, you were just a little kid when your dad started doing this, and you didn't even know at the time your dad was Dr. Morgus. That's correct. Um, I, was, uh, I was in preschool, really, and, um, and uh, we, my brother and I didn't know that dad was Morgus, and it, uh, it kind of came out accidentally um, when our, the lady who drove our carpool accidentally mentioned it uh, to us and and my brother of course ran home and to get clarification as to who who what is this news about dad is morgus so were you guys fans of, of of morgus well you know i think we watched a little bit but we were so young at the time we probably and it was on late know, very late yeah so we we uh but we my brother definitely knew who morgus was because he he said um he said he had he had seen a, a picture of Morgus, um, but uh, like a pu publicity picture. And uh, so Daddy said, "Oh, Mrs. So and So said Daddy's Morgus." And I I told her, "But Morgus is a friend of Dad's." <laughs> he didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so so we all had to sit down and have a family powwow about uh, this revelation, and then the fact that um, it was a family secret. We were asked to to. Keep it a secret, and you know, little kids love secrets. So we uh, we kept the secret. I mean, it seemed like forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sid actually talked about Morgus like it was a friend of his. Yes, exactly. Oh, which was kind of cool. And, and considering how rudimentary television was back in 1959, then in the 60s, while you guys, while he was at WWL TV, it's amazing the show that was put on. Really, really was. Um, he. he uh, he completely had to create everything from scratch. I mean, there was no set, there was no budget, there was uh, there were no writers. Just no writers. It was just his uh, his immense creativity and 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 real determination. I think that's what I think amazes me about your father so much is just how creative he was, and you know to take nothing and make something out of it, and then to make it last for decades. That just to me blows my mind. 
I think it blew his mind as well. <laughs> I think he always thought it was, uh, it might have just been a, a sort of short, um, fun I experience. And, uh, and I think it always amazed him that it endured for so long. And then he did bounce to a lot of stations. He went to Detroit, he went to uh, other places. He was trying to do it nationally syndicated. Um, but then it came back to New Orleans in the 80s and, and you guys were working the show then. Yep. What, what, what was your job? Well, I was an intern. I was a uh, student at Tulane my senior year and I went to WDSU and applied for an internship and got it and they assigned me to work on Morgus. So I showed up and we just looked at the calendar just now and realized it was January 20th, 1987. I walked in and uh, to the craziness and all the people there and first time in a TV station and they put me to work. That was a WDSU. At the issue, that's right. And However, the show was being shown on WGNO. That's right. right. So they that's used right. they used the, the they rented out the studios at WDSU. That set stood there standing for a couple of years while they were while we were doing the show. And so I I was an intern. I I did whatever they needed. I lifted and pushed and tore set up and tore down. But my my I, I like to say my my first job in television though was if you watch the show and you see the bubbling liquids in the test tubes and the Earl of Minor flask and everything. That's the, that was on camera day time, that's me. Me and, and the other interns, we would stand on the side with um, a big block of dry ice and we'd knock off little ch chips of it. Yeah. And we'd sit there on the side and when whenever uh, Reggie Hendry, the floor director would say, okay, they're, they're gonna be in the shot, we'd get there on the side and we'd stand by and he'd start counting down five, four, we'd, <laughs> as many as we could in the, in the five second count and then run off the set. And how old were you at the time? I would have been uh, yeah. 20. And, and was, did, 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 uh, did Sid ever break character while he was on the set with you guys or was he just total into it? Oh, no, he, he, there was Sid and there was Morgus. Okay. You know? and, and in between takes, you know, Sid, was, Sid, Sid ruled that set like, like a general, you know. He, he, he wanted things a certain way. And so he, he, he would direct the command things and which, which the director, Paul Yossage back in the booth yeah. found hilarious, you know, that he, he would tell the cameras to do that. And then Paul would get on and say, okay, that's pretty good, but we're going to do it like this. And so they'd be, you know, back and forth sometimes. That was part of the production. Yes. Yeah. I was uh, one of the writers and also I performed in three of the shows. Um, back in the fall of 86, Sid hired about five or six writers to work with him to help him uh, put the shows together. That first meeting we had, he pulled out this giant notebook and he already had sketched out 36 episodes. So he was ready to go for like a season and a half already. And that first month or two, he sat us down and told us the sketches and the ideas and got us into a mortgage world. And then we started uh, writing uh, for the different episodes. And remember, we, we talked about, uh, uh, about Sid having a photographic memory, and I said, I have the least photographic memory. Clearly, you can see that now. <laughs> and so, so what was it like working on that show with, with Sid? Um, in the writing's room, it was a lot of fun. He had us laughing all the time, at, but it was kind of curious because he had his certain ways that Morgus Worlds was supposed to work. So you might come up with some outlandish, crazy idea, and he would look at you and say, well, that's just stupid. <laughs> And then, really? and then he would say, how about a backyard nuclear generator that you can put in your apartment? It was a, oh yeah, sure, why not? So uh, it was a fun atmosphere, but it was also, you had to be grounded in science. And this was the years before Google. So we, we were looking through encyclopedias oh, true, yeah. and science books and all of that. So there was a, a real scientific grounding that he had in the room. So that that had to be there. He didn't want people coming up with jokes. It was all about the story and the characters and, and telling uh, his tale. And how different was the show you guys did in the 80s from the show that Natalie watched with her dad in the late 50s and early 60s? I've, I've seen some clips of it. That was much more raw yeah. um, uh, show. Because well, there were no writers then or anything. Right. And, 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 well, and, and yeah, the, and it was And the production was, uh, was more spontaneous. He always tried to make a show appear as if it was just happening right then. The early days, it really was. These days, it w had some scripting to it and had some planning to it, but it had that feeling of just happening. Did you guys ever make it out of the set during no. your show? No, but I did have some special honors. I was a vampire who got to bite Sid in the neck. I was an alien who had the power to freeze him and stop him from talking. And I was the headless body of Sid when he was decapitated in one show. And Eric was put on my body, and we took over the, sta the well, studio. Yeah, and speaking of Eric, I thought about it, since I'm Eric, I thought about coming as a skull today and just let Eric <laughs> do the talking. But 
that, uh, that day may come, but it'll be later. <laughs> it may. And, and Natalie, what, what was it like growing up in your family? Well, you know, everybody always asks me this question. What was it like growing up as, you know, daughter of Morgus or, you know, and it was, a, I promise it was an extremely normal life. <laughs> um, you know, and he we, wanted that. That's why he, he wanted did. his identity kept secret. Absolutely. He wanted us to have normal lives. He wanted us to um, be regular kids, you know, not uh, showbiz kids, as he was warned about. You don't want to put your children in that in that kind of light limelight. So we grew up very normally, and you know, my dad, just a wonderful, wonderful dad. As you know, he he was also. Um, a fantastic storyteller. He wrote uh, children's books, and so of course we we really benefited from all of the storytelling and, and the development of those stories because he would test drive them on us, and <laughs> and uh, and then he was extremely creative, as you know, and but also very handy DIY. Yeah. Enjoyed uh, making things, and we had a little country house out in Covington, and I mean he built us a wonderland of of wonderful zip lines and Tarzan ropes and and tree houses and things. So we, we, he really wanted us to have a normal, you know, healthy lifestyle. So that's was, how it was. <laughs> I was kind of wondering, did people, when they found out that you were Dr. Morgus's daughter and for your, your siblings as well, just like, did they think, oh, you guys must be rich because he's, he's on television, you know? <laughs> well, I think, I think people do, do think that if you're a, a television celebrity, Rich, but you know this was local. <laughs> this is local. Plus, Calvin. it was back as, way back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so you know, you kind of have to. Um, I think that's part of why you know we we were kept in in you know very private life that that we didn't we didn't have a lot of people knowing who we were. So it was uh, it was nice. And Natalie, when when you'd be around your dad, and did you realize at the time that? I mean, you, you know, you're, everybody thinks their dad is smart. Did you realize just, you know, how intelligent he was? <laughs> well, you know, I think you, your dad is always your hero. So, so I, I really did look up to him. Um, but I, his, his creative genius, I, I didn't see as evidently because, you know, he was involved in just daily life and, and of course, other businesses. He wasn't always Morgus. He, he had a, other businesses so but um, I always knew just how strongly you know creative and determined he was so that that was evident but uh, but no you I don't think you can appreciate it but I really think that night at the Orpheum I, I he just blew me it. away yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it really showed there yeah and, and uh, Paul and Derek you guys were on the set with with uh, Sid you probably have stories that you know fans of Morgus have no idea because you know, we only see what the finished product was. We didn't see what the behind the scenes, the, the, you know, kind of like when you're talking about Congress and the making of sausage, you guys were making the production. I mean, what was it like? Um, sometimes I would sit in the uh, control booth with the director and the, and the technical director. And we did a show called uh, uh, The Talent Machine. And he brought in Pete Fountain. And we were all excited because Pete Fountain was on the set. And Pete only had like two or three lines to do. But in the middle of one of his lines, uh, Morgus stopped and made him do it again, and then stopped and made him do it again. And we ended up doing 14 takes, because Sid was such a perfectionist and wanted lines done cer certain ways, and Pete couldn't. Pete was a good sport. Yeah. So he, he, he did it fine, and he did that. And then at the end of, of doing those lines, he has Pete put his head into the machine, and Morgus sucks all his talent out of him. <laughs> And, and what are some of your memories behind the scenes? Well, you know, that, that brings up a good point, too, because Sid did want things to be just right. He had, a, he had a vision in his head of what the scene should look like, what the line should be like. And if he didn't get that, he might want to do it again. Um, but there's only one thing that didn't apply to. That was Tommy George, Chopsley. Yeah. Uh, uh, you Sid, said he was really important to the show, yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, if you watch those the episodes where Tommy George is Chopsley, um, uh, Tommy is back there doing something. Uh, Sid's doing his monologue or talking, the, and Tommy's back there doing something entirely different a lot of times. He may be swatting the fly or picking some stuff or, 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 or reacting to, to Sid, or one time someone screamed, as you're supposed to, and instead of letting him scream, Tommy reaches around and covers his mouth. These are all unexpected moments that Tommy improvised. 
And, and um, anyone else, Sid would have like stopped and said, no, 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 that's not what I want. We're gonna do it this way. But for Tommy, he just, he, he let Tommy do those things and it was all the better for it. Later, Tommy passed away during the run of the show and Jim Giot uh, came over and took over as, as Chopsley. Jim did a great job, but he didn't have that sort of know-how and repertoire, uh, rapport, should be, with, with Sid. So um, he would do just what Sid told him to do. And, and he was a fine Chopsley, but that Tommy George magic just wasn't there, that, that rapport wasn't there. And, it, and it's really, yeah. you can really see it in the, in the, in the early episodes with Tommy. And yeah. how long were you guys on the show? With um, I was in the series for 52 episodes as a, as a writer, but I was only on stage three times on, on camera. And I joined uh, as an intern on the fifth episode and, and went all the way through. They ended up, the production company hired me after my internship ended. Yeah. So I went from a lowly unpaid uh, intern to a lowly paid production. <laughs> so. And, and how, how big of a staff was it back in those days? Because in, in, in uh, when it first started on WWL TV, it was kind of Sid and that was it. Well, and Chopsley. One person I want to mention is Phil Broadbridge because he was a um, carpenter. A cabinet maker who made all of those machines. Yeah. And so we would have a three week window from when we started writing till they started filming. And the second week, uh, second two weeks were filled making those things. Sid would make the drawings and go over what he wanted and then this man could create them. So that was a major part of the show. And it's funny because you think about it, in the early days, it was, it was live television. You guys were taping this so you could stop and do yeah. things over and again. We did. And you did a lot. You did it with Pete Fountain. Yeah. But, but it, 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 do you think the feel was, was totally different? Sid, actually, because he was the main writer, uh, only the first part of the show, that opening where he would explain certain things, was on a teleprompter and was fully scripted. He improvised a lot on the set, and that's why he could work with Tommy so well. All of the actors who came in, who, who the day players, they had lines to do, and, and, and Sid worked with them. But a lot of the stuff where he's alone with Tommy, there's a lot of improvisation going on there. The script was an outline. After yeah. the opening, the rest was an outline. What, what, what was the biggest number of people on the set at one time? Oh, we had, I think we had, uh, mostly people with actors, we had like a protest out in the hallway one time with people marching. And we had yeah. many different crowds inside. But yeah. generally, it was, you know, it was the DSU production crew. Yeah. So like three cameramen, audio, Floor director, that kind of thing. Of course, we had the infant uh, school where there were four babies <laughs> and their parents on stage. <laughs> which, which, if you watch that episode, you'll notice the infants disappear at some point during the. That episode. was really <laughs> difficult. And, and then, unlike unlike the old days when it was done live, you guys actually went outside and shot outside things yeah. like that. Before it was all done in the studio. Even at one of the parades. Yeah, yeah. we did. We shot uh, uh, on St. Charles Avenue. Uh, yeah. We did that. Well, that was Sid called the entire parade. That That's was right. that was a special episode. But we even worked a Mardi Gras parade into a regular episode. Well, I don't think it was a Mardi Gras parade. It was something else in the context of the show. But we took advantage of you know what was going on and pulled the camera out and shot that. Just quickly, some of your favorite memories about Sid that that people wouldn't know. I, I think to me it's just the whole persona. It was like working with Don Quixote. This guy was the. Uh, Morgus was the guy tilting, I mean, uh, Chasing tilting windmills, yeah. the scientific windmills, you know, and he had, he, the show, this guy always failed, but he had this great enthusiasm and kind of positive energy always. And Sid had that same thing. And it just kind of lit up the room when he was around. And, and you know, again, Sid wanted a, a, a perfect product a lot of times. So he would, he would do things again and again until he got that. But a lot of times, like those, those the first pass or the first one, or, or times when things went wrong, and he just would allow himself to go with it, like in the old days. So it was you got that moment of improvisation and spontaneity. You know, those those were magic, and some of those made it into the show, and, and some some didn't. You know, because because something else went wrong somewhere along the way. But we were there to see that happen, and that was that was magic sometimes. And, and Natalie, what do you think was was the lure of of Doctor Morgus, a character? developed in 1959 that went on for decade after decade after decade and then filled an auditorium just to hear your dad speak. Yeah, I think Dr. Morgus really captured the imagination of everybody. Like, sometimes my dad would even say, you know, sometimes I think people think he's real. <laughs> he wasn't? <laughs> <'Cause> he, <laughs> because he was one of us, you know. He, he was struggling 
like everybody else. And he felt that um, he was always, you know, battling uh, one thing or another. And so I think I think that it was the an, an enduring quality that that people really um, could relate to to him. And of course, to make them laugh, take them away from their problems. And it's funny because I always thought it was just a New Orleans thing, but then when you hear him on stage talking about going to Detroit and other places, it's just like, other people got it? And it, was, it wasn't just us? Yeah, <laughs> this is true. Yeah, he was in, in other cities, Detroit, New York. Um, so I, I think uh, he, he, he certainly had a, a universal appeal. And I know he, he was always hoping to be syndicated and, and have a wider, yeah. wider audience. But, but, uh, but I think in New Orleans, we like offbeat characters anyway. Yes. That's true. And he was yeah, one of the true. most offbeat of all. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and that's the one thing I do love about this town are the characters and boy, your dad was truly one of them. And, and tell us about that night he went on stage at the Orpheum. So yeah, I have a really uh, great memory of that night. Um, we were, uh, the, sh the show had finished, we were in the dressing room packing up and, um, and dad turned to me and he said, you know, in, in all of my years and, and in all of my experiences, he said, I've, I've really never felt the love of my fans like I did tonight. And he was very touched. Um, and you know, you can also think he, he hadn't been in front of a live yeah. audience in many years. I'd never seen him in front of a live audience myself. So, so he, um, he was truly touched by the, the standing ovations and the energy that the audience was feeding him with. And um, so we were leaving and uh, we, we walked past the curtain of the stage and for a minute, he, he stepped back on the stage. Um, the lights were dim, the, the theater was completely empty. And he, he stood there and he looked up to the, to the top seat and he threw a kiss uh, to the top seats. And I think it was his way of, of sending back the love and, and saying thank you to his and, fans. So. What was he like right before the show started? He had to be apprehensive about and you had to be apprehensive about how he did. I was incredibly apprehensive because I, I know the night before he wasn't looking over notes or studying or doing anything that I would be probably a nervous wreck, but um, he, was, he was just uh, you know, a, as relaxed as he could be in the, in the dressing room before the performance, just completely relaxed. He, he knew exactly what he was gonna do. And, and he, he, I think, again, that photographic memory is, he, uh, he certainly already had it all scripted out in his head. So. And I'll tell you how naive I was. I called your dad several times before the show thinking, you know, it's been a long time, Sid. You haven't been in front of an audience in a long time. Why don't you come on, on Channel 4 and we'll give you some publicity and it'll help with ticket sales. And he, he, we banned Banded back and banded back and forth for a, for a while, a couple of calls, and then he said, "No, I'm not. I'm not going to come on." And then all of a sudden, the tickets went on sale, and they went like that. <laughs> and I'm going, "Oh my God!" <laughs> Incredible. You know, I know. I know he was really, really uh, so happy and thankful that he had such a great turnout for that event. You know? and, and and one of the cool things we're going to do right now is is, you know, we do want to thank the Historic New Orleans Collection for doing this. By the way, we are in, in what was an old ice house in New Orleans that the, uh, the Historic New Orleans Collection owns. Of course, your dad used to do it in a fake ice house. That's right. <laughs> but it, it's kind of ironic we're doing this in what used to be an actual ice house uh, here in the French Quarter, uh, where, where uh, uh, part of what WDSU used to be. Uh, but anyway, that show at the Orpheum, um, on October 13th, 2019 was special. And for those who haven't seen it, wow, you're in for a treat. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, we should do this. Oh. Yeah, we should, we should do this, right? All right. <laughs> yeah. Eric, Eric, you need to do this now. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. I forgot about that, yeah. I kept holding the pen. Like, oh, yeah, don't say <laughs> Two fingers on the right hand, left eye. Oh yeah. Well, that was really wonderful. Thank you all so much. I mean, that was such an amazing performance by Sid. It was so wonderful to hear him again. Uh, so we are so excited to be joined by Natalie and Derek and Paul 
You saw them earlier in the panel discussion. Hello, Derek, Natalie, and Paul, how are you doing? Hello. Doing great. Good to be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I think you'll need to, oh, there you go. You unmuted yourself, perfect. Um, Natalie, I, I just want to start off by asking you, um, that was an amazing performance by your dad. I mean, he talked for just about an hour there straight and just was so dynamic and it just was so, it just seemed so effortless. Do you remember when he was preparing for this performance, kind of his process? And did you have conversations about what he wanted to discuss? So um, he actually had done a practice round, I would say, um, at Christwood, which was the retirement community where he lived and a wonderful place. And um, he had such a fantastic um, reception uh, for that uh, performance that he did there, a little more informal. Um, but uh, he started thinking about it and, and thought, well, why not do this? And, and he wanted to um, raise funds for the Alzheimer's research um, foundation. And, uh, and so that was sort of the genesis of, of, of his, uh, putting this together. But, um, he, I never saw him preparing for anything. I mean, it was funny because the night before the performance, um, he, my, my dad lived on the North shore and he, he stayed with me here in new Orleans the night before, and he had plans for dinner with friends and, and he just, he never looked at notes or anything, which made me very nervous. I thought, oh my gosh, I'd be home studying, you know? So um, in any case, um, same thing before the performance, just really relaxed. It, it was it was all in his head. He knew exactly what he was going to do. So, um, and at the time, I mean, people have asked me, how, how old was he? He was uh, 89 and 10 months. He was almost 90 at the time of that performance. And uh, so it, it really did, um, it really did just blow my mind that he was so, so sharp and, and on, you know, it was great. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we um, have some questions here from the audience. We've been getting some great questions uh, while we were watching the performance. So uh, one question here for maybe for Derek and Paul, although Natalie, you might know too. Um, John is asking, Morgus had a large extensive sets and special equipment for each episode. Are any of the props still in existence? Um, a few. And uh, let's see, <laughs> because I spirited a few away. Uh -huh. um, and I'll say this because the, um, what I say is, is, you know, Phil Broadridge built the machines and and the large set pieces and stuff. And when when the show was over, they were all transported over to uh, Paul Yostich's studio at Elmwood, and and we never use them again. But they were kind of stored in there. And at one point, I, I hate to say, they were kind of broken down and, and sent to the dump. And it's just they, you know, it really didn't. They didn't see any value at the time, and 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 there, there was a lot of it, and it just it wasn't practical to keep things. But you know, I worked on the show. I was working for Paul at the time, and so I just had to grab a few little things. And let's see, for instance, oh, here we go. This is a piece of the set. <laughs> so going blurry on me here uh this was actually not the set this is not the regular set this was a uh, a piece of the set that that phil broadridge who built the set he built an extension of the set for a particular episode so even though the the real set uh sid kept and stored for a long time himself uh this little piece of set um i was able to grab because it, it went into that that uh that area and here's something that i i kept that I keep in my office at work, but I brought it home to show the folks and this um, production. This, it keeps going blurry at that setting there, but here we go. This is the is a man-eating plant that was used in, uh, what was the episode, Paul? Do you remember? Uh, the, we turned a man into a plant. Right. Actually grew him into a plant over the course of the episode. And a, um, a special effects guy in town who... Um, uh, if Lewis is is in the in the chat, he might be able to put his name on there. Um, 
uh, the, the guy made it. He's still around town. He did a few special effects items for the show, and he built this as well. So I keep this on my shelf. I got a few other things that I kept as well. Some basically some, got two rubber gloves that become the puppet yeah. staff if they yeah. move, and then he could swallow something and eat it. It's a puppet. It's yeah. a puppet. Uh, I put, there's my hand, but there's a, a a a glove here that the puppeteer would wear and would sit on a, on a um. I on a it's on a his daughters who uh, operated. I think yes, I believe she did. She, uh, um, uh, they all had much tinier hands than, than I did actually, and <laughs> and other folks. So they were perfect for this. Um, but anyways, so this and some like so some books and some other other little small items. But there's not a whole lot that I'm aware of that that is remaining um, from the show. Now I don't know Natalie if they if if uh, Sid kept any souvenirs himself or if you had any. No, uh, unfortunately, not at all. He didn't keep anything. Um, he, it, it just, it all disappeared, unfortunately. I don't have anything. And um, now certainly other people may have gotten, you know, from, from the set or, or something. I know he donated some items to, it might've been Loyola, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, no, there, there isn't anything that I know of. I have my uh, custom-made vampire teeth. Uh, that I <laughs> that's right. Upset oh, and that's it. When I was a vampire. And, uh, that's right. And, and, uh, and I, 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 I I've got up in school at the time, and one of my former students was a dental technician who made a cast in my mouth and made the uh, vampire teeth for me. So I used those to sink into Sid. <laughs> and I've got a... Um... A, a nuclear fuel rod <laughs> uh, made of, you know, cardboard <laughs> uh, somewhere around too. So yeah, that's about it though. That's very cool. And yes, somebody just posted in the chat that um, the, some of the set walls were donated to UNO to their theater department, which Natalie, that might've been what you were referencing. That might've yeah. been what I remembered exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, that was great. Thank you so much, Derek, for showing us those bits of uh, the props that you have. Um, there's a question here from Sharon. She's asking, are there any plans to publish a biography of Sid Noel or a comprehensive book of Morgus's activities? I'm glad that she <laughs> put out those two different ideas. <laughs> well, I can't say that there's anything, but you never know. But, uh, but I, I, uh, I, I know that there are a lot of fans out there and a lot of people who have... Um, hopes and creative ideas of, about, and just want to share these things, so, yeah. They are uh, taking some of the original tapes and making DVDs, so they put out uh, four episodes already, and there's another four that will be coming out soon. So I think gradually they're converting some of the old, um, I think it's one-inch uh, videotapes. Well, I think... I think um, I heard that the one-inch tapes don't actually exist any longer, ah. uh, unfortunately. And so they had uh, stepped them down to a uh, half-inch format or even a DVD format. That's what they're working for. They still look great, you know, but uh, uh, that's what they're using for those, um, for the DVD uh, issues. That's right. And the, the, so there's a volume one DVD that's available and uh, there'll be a volume two coming out. Um, just before Christmas, and <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, for those who wish to collect the these uh, wonderful things, um, they'll be available through Morgus.com. And uh, just, I grabbed these two, by the way. Um, you're talking about the books. Uh, I don't know. Is it, is it right side for you all or backwards for you all? Yep. I can't tell. Uh, so these are these are books from the Morgus set. You know, if you look carefully, some of these were were back on the set again. This is something something easy to, to uh, for me to hold on to. Here we go. The Complete Clone. And uh, these are all authored by Mormons Alexander Morgus. So, you know, very important documents here. And here's my favorite. Here we go. There we go. Um, and uh, and, and I, I will not be revealing the interiors because these are proprietary, but uh, <laughs> know that they exist. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Derek and Paul, maybe y'all can answer this question. Darren would like to know, were there cue cards um, used or a teleprompter? The amount of dialogue Sid had was massive. Yes, um, he used a teleprompter just for the, the opening two sec segments. There was an opening where he first talked to the audience, and went to a break, and then he finished explaining the thing. That was pretty much the only thing on the teleprompter. Um, there was dialogue written for the actors who came on, but a lot of the uh, Sid's dialogue, he had a sketch of it, but he was not improvising because he kind of worked it out ahead of time. 
but since he was the head writer, it was already in his head and he would kind of sometimes rewrite it on the set. So only the first two segments were actually fully scripted. And then the segments where there were, he was talking with other actors. All right, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, and Natalie, um, John is asking, what was Halloween like at your dad's house? Was he big on decorating? <laughs> um, I do remember a period of time where we did do quite a bit of decorating. Um, I think it was really my brother who spearheaded that. And then I, I think it, it, it got a little out of control and we had a little too many visitors. So, um, so I think from then onward, you know, we, we, in 1979, we moved to the North shore and, uh, and we, we, we were no longer nearby to, uh, to do really Halloween or anything like that. So. That's fair enough. I can imagine everybody would want to go to retreating at Morgus's house. <laughs> Morgus did do a Halloween episode, which didn't end up well. Oh. <laughs> for for, for, for the, the people that were experimented on, I think the audience had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aaron is asking which episodes of the 80s, um, 1980s series featured Tommy George as, as Chopsley? Oof. I don't... Remember, we, we started um, in January of 87 and he died in 87. I'm thinking early summer. So we um, probably would have gotten through maybe a dozen uh, or maybe more of that first year uh, episodes before uh, Tommy passed away. But I don't, yeah, have, I, I don't, have I don't remember the date exactly. The yeah. first, um, yeah, was, third or less yeah, of that first, first set, yeah. So you know the first the first dozen or so episodes it's definitely Tommy, but yeah. uh, I don't remember when when the transition happened. Yeah, we'd have to look at the episodes because you can see a physical difference. The other gentleman was tall, but he wasn't as broad or, or as thick as as Tommy was. Um, somebody is asking here: Was there ever thoughts about doing a second movie, Morgus movie? Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think so. I think uh, I think that was the one um, <laughs> wonderful effort. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do it right the first time, right? <laughs> first time. That's right. <laughs> That's right. We have a question here. Oh, let's see. I was trying to find it again. Um, John is asking. Um, he's asking about Morgus's makeup. Um, he says, how about the Morgus makeup? It seems Sid used a foam rubber appliance on his nose. Um, and in the early days, I think I could see raised cheeks. Am I correct? Do y'all know about the makeup, his makeup technique that he used? Well, I know in the eighties episodes, he, um, it was pretty, it was pretty simple. I mean, it was, a, it's a wig and some stage makeup and a putty nose. He used mortician's putty. He had this, this jar of mortician's putty and he'd sit, there's a, there was a uh, makeup table right on the side of the set that was actually for the WDSU uh, news um, talent to sit down and put a little powder on their face. But he would sit down there before the start of the show and he'd, he'd pull out some putty and he'd, he'd mold his nose. And, it, and I always find that just interesting because that means if you look at him carefully, that nose is different every time. And he, he had a look he wanted, but it's different every time because it's handmade for every time he puts it on. Um, beyond that, it's, there's really not a lot of, you know, it's, 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 again, it's the wig, it's the putty nose and the stage makeup. Um, at least that's the way, what he was doing in the, in the eighties before it. And for that, I couldn't tell you what, what it looked like. Oh, and, and, and he used to have teeth. Did he have teeth, Paul, for the eighties run? Yes, I think he put in some okay. teeth. Okay, some teeth. There, there you go. The first time I was on set and saw him doing the makeup, um, I went up to him just as he was finished, and I, I started to call him Sid. And he got up <laughs> and looked around and said, Sid's not here. <laughs> Morgus? And he, he wanted me to call him Morgus once he had the makeup on. He really kind of took on the persona. And said, don't, don't ever conflict the two. <laughs> oh, I'm getting, a, we have a question here from Armand. Um, and he is asking, what happened to the fables that Sid wrote? So your father wrote this, um, a book of fables. Are they available? Yes. So, um, so back in the time of his sabbatical, <laughs> you remember, um, 
he uh, he did write a series of children's fables, um, and they were uh, in sort of the first um, first program. It was uh, to be character education in schools, and they they were um, in many many schools in the area. and And he um, he later uh, uh, created a website. It's called the Internet Story Club. So if you go to internetstoryclub.org, there are 52 children's fables that he wrote. They're wonderful. Um, there's a parent's guide and a teacher's guide, and it is still available. It's something, it's a gift that he wanted to give. Um, he was a wonderful storyteller, and he, um, he, really wanted, um, he really wanted to pass on that legacy. So it is, it's still online. And, um, and, and yeah, I think, uh, I think it's an in, certainly enduring part of his, what, what he really was passionate about. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And please uh, visit that site. Maybe we can drop the link in the chat if people would like to go and check that out. Um, we have a comment here, a couple of comments. Um, Albert Fisher is here with us tonight and he worked on mm -hmm. the House of Shock with your dad back in the original, very early days, the original days of the series. So hello, Albert. Thank you hello, so much. Hello, Albert. <laughs> <laughs> and we have uh, another- Albert knows where all the skeletons are buried. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Just> kidding. <laughs> Literal and figurative. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And we have another question or comment here from uh, Christine, and she says um, there was an episode that featured a shrinking, mach shrinking machine, and Morgus put a collie in it, and out came a Sheltie. We were the proud owners of a collie and a Sheltie, and we just loved that one. So <laughs> that, that was our dog Sheba, who was a, a collie that got uh, to uh, make a debut there uh, on that show. So oh, yeah. oh that's so fun! Yeah. <laughs> Um, he shrunk, I, I believe he shrunk um, Chopsley in that episode, uh, compressed, compressed Chopsley. So he turned from, from uh, Jim Giot, who, who was playing Chopsley in the, in the later episodes, turned him into Uncle Wayne Daggerpon. If you all know both of those folks in town, you, it's quite, quite a difference there, but he shrunk him. <laughs> it's called weight loss. That was it, yep. Oh, we're getting a question here. And Natalie, you spoke a little bit about this in our panel discussion with Eric Paulson, but um, uh, we know that they tried to keep um, your dad's identity, his TV identity, a secret from y'all. But um, we have a question here asking if any of your childhood friends knew that your dad was Morgus or if they were interested in that. <laughs> so um, so I, I think I must have been around maybe four years old when I was, uh, you know, we had the family chat about uh, keeping the secret. And uh, I do remember being in kindergarten and I remember a friend of mine in kindergarten um, taking me aside and saying that he knew my secret, but that he wouldn't tell. So, um, <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, I do. Re I remember that vividly. Uh, so that's how young I was. I was about five years old, and uh, and it was a secret. I mean, you you know, you never you never talked about it. And I, I even had friends who only recently said, "You never told us in high school that your dad was Morgus." So you know, it uh, it was just one of those things. I mean, my dad did go on. I, I saw one of the questions come up of what other things did my dad do? You know, he, he was in many different businesses. Um, he was very entrepreneurial. So, you know, my dad was on television when I was very, very young, like uh, five. And, and then um, he was on and off television. So, so he was uh, in other businesses, manufacturing and so forth. So, uh, so yeah, we just didn't talk about it. <laughs> What a wide range of careers your dad yeah, has. Yes. <laughs> stories, you know, and, yes, stories and manufacturing and everything in between. That secrecy was also part of the mystique of the show because his name does not appear on any of the credits. He never, it, it was always Morgus played by himself, Chopsley played by himself. He never, even though he was producer, head writer, and star, he never took personal credit. He wanted to keep that mystique that this was Morgus's show and Morgus had created it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Despite the worst efforts of all those idiots down at the station. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, so we're getting a question here from Wayne. This is really fun. Um, Wayne says, someone in the chat mentioned watching for surprise cameos. Who were some of the surprise cameos in the show? It was great to see P Pete Fountain in one of the clips tonight. Well, just about, you know, everybody from the New Orleans theater community uh, wound up on the show at some point. Uh, you know, uh, Sid kind of, he, he made a, a point to, to not reuse talent. Um, uh, he, he wanted the, again, to, to sort of, you know, it's a, it's a real, this is really happening. So you can't see a person playing one character, one episode and a different character, another episode. So he, 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 uh, he, he really uh, avoided trying to, to bring people on as more than one character. So a lot of the New Orleans uh, theater community ended up on that show. So if you knew folks in theater in the 80s, they're all over that, uh, that show. Everybody's in there. From back in the old days from TV, probably one of the, the stars that slipped in was Wayne Mack, who had been on the Midday Show for a long time, who came in and did one of the episodes. That's right. That's the yeah. one I'm in. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to mention one of the actresses who was a regular was his landlady, Mrs. Fetish, who's uh, still acting right now. She's the grandmother in the Adams Family musical out in, in J Pass this this weekend. Janet Shea still performing oh, very cool. into her. Yeah. That's great. And, yeah. And Matt Burrell uh, was one of the other regulars. He, he played Wiley Faye, Morgus's manager, and he was a. Uh, uh, regular in theater around town and, and still around too. So uh, those are some of the folks you'd see on the show. Oh, well, we have time for just a couple more questions. And I apologize, everyone, we didn't get to everyone's questions tonight, but uh, this has been a wonderful talk. So a couple more here. Um, Austin is asking, did Dr. John do a Morgus tune or am I misremembering? <laughs> Yes, there is a, uh, a Dr. John. Uh, he, he participates in a song. And, it, and as I understand, because some folks did a little research on that a few months ago, it's not an authorized song, as I, as I, as I have heard. It was just sort of a, uh, Morgus was a big hit at the time. It's kind of more, uh, some of the Morgus and the Five Ghouls or something like that. But I don't know that it was, it was authorized. It was kind of a, of a, of a, of a, um, uh, well, unauthorized uh, song. Do you know anything about it, Natalie? The, the details of it? Um, it's, it's called Morgus the Magnificent. Um, I really, I'm, I really don't know many details about it. I know that. Um, well, we certainly have friends that might know more, but, um, but yeah, it's out there. I mean, you can, you can definitely find it. Uh, it's a great I song. And, and Dr. John is one of the performers uh, as, <laughs> as Mac Rabinac. It's before Dr. John actually when he performs. That's right. Right. Well, we have one more. And this one is for Natalie. This is from John. Um, he says, what future plans does Natalie have to keep her, her, her father's memory alive for his current and future fans? Well, I, um, I, I really appreciate that question. I think, um, you know, this, this forum here really shows us too how there's an enduring um, love for Morgus. And um, I can't be specific about anything. There are some, some interesting uh, uh, things that we're working on. Um, we do, as we mentioned, we have the, the DVDs that are coming out and we thinking of making a whole series of them. Um, but, uh, but we'll just kind of have to keep the fans to stay, to ask them to stay tuned. Um, certainly, you know, join the Facebook groups, the Friends of Science, um, Morgusomania, and, uh, and our, our Facebook page, the Morgus, uh, Morgus Facebook page, visit Morgus.com and, and uh, we'll keep you, we'll keep you apprised of those kinds of things, so. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, you know, this performance by your dad is also such a wonderful record of his life and his career. We're so happy at the Historic New Orleans Collection that we get to archive it and make it available to everyone to watch. Um, and so, you know, that uh, this will live on, his memory will live on. Um, and I'm so glad he got to share that with us. Um, so Natalie, Paul, and Derek, thank you so much. It's been such a wonderful conversation tonight. I really appreciate y'all being here. Uh, with all of us. I'd like to do a shout out to my fellow writers, uh, Sydney Arroyo and Dalt Wonk, who aren't here tonight, but uh, suffered and enjoyed with me for a long time <laughs> with Sid. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda and Historic New Orleans Collection. Um, I know my dad was very proud to, uh, to turn this 
over to you guys and knew that it would be in, in great hands for posterity. So uh, we appreciate that. And uh, we thank you for putting all of this together. Absolutely. It's been so wonderful. It's been great. Yes, thank you, Derek. And um, as we said earlier, this performance will be uh, available starting on Friday on YouTube. If you go to the Historic New Orleans Collections YouTube page, you can find it there. And until, until we all meet again, have a great night. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Thank you.